Hello, I'm Kevin Cowton from the University of York and today I'd like to talk about what the word mean means in the phrase global mean surface temperature. This is based on our recent paper in the journal Dynamics and Statistics of the Climate System. Now it may seem that there's not very much interesting to say about the word mean. It's a pretty common statistical concept. However, as with many statistical terms, there's a lot more subtlety than initially meets the eye. To illustrate that, here's a question. Suppose that you are offered two observational data sets. The first on the left covers 83% of the planet. The second on the right only covers 18% of the planet. You want to estimate the global mean surface temperature anomaly and you're going to do it by calculating the average of all the cells for which there are observations weighted by the area of each grid cell. Which observational data set should you use, A or B? Now, if you can't give a, a statistical explanation for why the right answer might be B, then you can probably learn something from this lecture. Okay. So let's think about the word mean. Now, in terms of global mean, there's a fairly obvious interpretation that we take the integral of temperature over the surface area of the Earth and divide by the area, and that gives us our global mean. So far, so good. Now, we usually work from gridded data, so actually this turns into summation over all the grid cells weighted by the grid cell area which is approximately the cosine of the latitude. Uh, so this is often referred to as the cosine weighted mean and is very widely used. Well, we have a problem, which is that we don't have observations for all the grid cells. So what we can do is just calculate an average over the cells that we have. And here's where the problem really arises. To see why, let's look at a simpler problem. Suppose we want to know the average height of human adults. So we take a, a large sample of people, say 50,000 is a good large sample, and we calculate the average height of them. But if we then discover that our sample consisted of 40,000 men and only 10,000 women, then we might worry that we're actually not going to get a good average because men are on average a bit taller than women. So what we could, could we do? One thing we could do is throw away 30,000 of the observations and leaving 10,000 men and 10,000 women. And that will actually lead to a better estimate of the average height of a human adult. Okay, let's consider a slightly different case. Now we only have a sample of five people, but four of them are men and one is a woman. Should we do the same thing and throw away three observations in order to create a more representative sample? Well, that's a more difficult question. If we only have a sample size of two, then the chance of those two people being particularly tall or particularly short is quite high. When we have a small sample, we don't want to make our sample even smaller. So there's a problem here. How we average our data depends on the sample size, which seems a bit strange. So what's going on? What we have is two competing sources of error. We have sample noise from having a small sample and sample bias from having a sample that is unrepresentative of the population as a whole. And both of these are contributing. So what do we do about it? To minimise sample bias, we really want to weight the observations according to their prevalence in the population, so we get an average that's representative of the whole population. To minimise sample noise, we really want to weight the observations equally, so that we don't inflate the effect of any outlier, whether it's a tall or a short person. And these two requirements are in conflict. So what we really need is a method of calculating an average which optimally weights the data, taking into account both sample noise and sample bias. 
and these weights will vary both with noise and with sample size. Now, how might that work? Well, we can start with a technique that we already know, like ordinary least squares. Now, the most common application of ordinary least squares is to plot a straight line through a set of data. In this case, we're fitting two parameters to the data, the mean and the slope of the line. But we can also fit more or fewer parameters. If we fit three parameters, we can fit a curve. If we fit just one parameter, then we're fitting a constant. And it turns out that that constant is mathematically identical to the mean of the data. So we can say that the mean is a least squares estimator for a constant fit to the data. However, if you remember the theory of ordinary least squares, it depends on some assumptions about the data. Firstly, that they are homoscedastic, in other words, that they have equal variance. And secondly, that they're independent or uncorrelated. Now, are these assumptions true of the temperature data? Well, let's look at some temperature data. Now, it's probably hard to judge whether the data are homoscedastic or not. However, we can see that they are not independent. If we have an observation that's cold, like these, for example, then it's much more likely that neighbouring observations will also be cold, and similarly for hot data. What can we do when the observations are not independent? Instead of using ordinary least squares, we have to use generalised least squares. Now, in ordinary least squares, if we're calculating a constant fit to the data, then x will be a vector of 1s, so we sum the data and divide by n. In generalised least squares, there is an extra term, which is the inverse of the variance-covariance matrix of observations. So this term becomes a weight which is applied to each observation. Instead of calculating an unweighted average, we're now calculating a weighted average. Now, the inverse of the variance-covariance matrix is related to the information matrix. So the covariance matrix serves to weight each observation in accordance with the amount of independent information that it contains. Where does the covariance matrix of observations come from? We can work it out from the observations that we have, and it turns out that the covariance drops with the distance between two observations. In fact, for technical reasons, we'll use the correlation matrix instead of the covariance matrix, and that's well modelled by an exponential function. Observations which close together show good agreement at dropping with distance. So if we use the correlation matrix in the generalised least squares equations, then we get a set of weights for the observations. And what do those weights look like? Well, here's the simplest case where we have spatially complete coverage. And you can see that observations near the equator receive greater weight than observations at the poles, which is what we'd expect given that cells have larger areas there. In fact, if we look at the GLS weights, they agree exactly with the cell areas. Generalised least squares has reproduced area weighting without being told the areas of the cells. Here is a more interesting case. In this case, we still have global observations, but the density of observations in the Eastern Hemisphere is a quarter of the density of observations in the Western Hemisphere. Now, if we calculate a simple cosine weighted average, we'll get a temperature which is 80% Western Hemisphere and only 20% Eastern Hemisphere, which is not what we want. However, if we use a generalised least squares average, the cells in the Eastern Hemisphere are upweighted by a factor of 4, leading to something that is a true global average in which the hemispheres have equal weight. Here's a more extreme case. Again, we have full coverage in the Western Hemisphere, but we only have a single observation in the Eastern Hemisphere. Now, this observation is upweighted further. However, it's not upweighted to try and account for an entire hemisphere. There is no way this observation can be informative for a whole hemisphere. In fact, it's upweighted 
to have an equal weight to the observations in this circle in the Western Hemisphere, which has a radius of a little over a thousand kilometers. The covariance matrix tells us that the amount of information in this one observation is roughly equivalent to the information in the observations in this circle. Here's a more realistic case based on a month from the CRUTEM4 data. And you can see that isolated observations receive the highest weight. Pairs of observations, neighboring, uh, receive about half weight. Densely sampled regions, each cell is weighted in inverse proportion to the density of observations in that area. So we can see that the generalized least squares average applies at what seem to be sensible weights to individual grid cells for a number of different problem cases. The question is, does it lead to a better estimate of the global mean? To test this, we need a temperature field where we know the right answer. So we'll use a temperature field from a weather model reanalysis. So we will calculate the mean of the global temperature field and then we'll reduce coverage to match the observations from a given year in the historical record. Then we'll use different methods to estimate the global mean using just the spatially incomplete observations. So the first method we'll look at is the cosine weighted mean, which is shown by the black dots here. Now you can see that for recent decades, the error due to coverage is about seven hundredths of a Celsius. This goes up a little before about 1960 when we don't have Antarctic stations and increases substantially during the two world wars. And then in the 1860s and 1870s, when coverage is particularly poor, the errors are much larger. However, this isn't the method that, that the Met Office use. They use the mean of the hemispheric means shown by the red squares. Now this gives marginally better results for recent decades and is actually significantly better during the world wars. Another method that has been suggested is the mean of the zonal means shown by the green crosses. This has been used for radio sonde data. And this works quite a lot better for recent decades, but is actually worse prior to 1960. Finally, we can look at the generalized temperature average shown by the blue crosses. Now this is much better for recent decades with an error of only about three hundredths of a Celsius. Uh, prior to 1960, it doesn't perform so well, but it is always better than any of the other methods, even in the earlier periods. We can also use this analysis to look at the sources of uncertainty. Earlier on, I made the distinction between sample bias due to the sample being unrepresentative and sample noise due to the sample being too small. And we can evaluate both of these analytically using these equations. These are shown in this graph with the dashed line, the top and bottom lines, representing the cosine weighted mean. So this top line is the error due to coverage and the bottom line is the error due to small sample size. If we use the generalized least squares average, we adjust the weights of the observations in order to reduce the coverage error at a cost of increasing the sample noise. However, given that the coverage error dominates the uncertainty, this gives us a net win in terms of overall uncertainty. We're now in a position to answer the question I posed at the beginning. Should we use observational data set A or B if we're using a simple cosine weighted average? And we'll use the same approach as before. We'll start from the global reanalysis data, reduce the coverage to a given level, and calculate the error which arises from using the cosine weighted mean. And then what I'll do is take away one grid cell at a time, choosing the grid cell which is least informative according to the variance covariance matrix, and recalculate the error. So here's what happens. <laughs> 
The red line indicates the error due to coverage as we remove cells. And you can see at first nothing happens, but then as the coverage reduces, we actually reduce the error in the estimate of the global mean. The red line shows the case where we have no noise in the observations. And it continues to reduce until we're down to about a third of the data and then starts to increase. The yellow line shows the case where we do have noise in the data and then we see a bigger penalty th for throwing away observations. So here's the case I used in the question where we have about 18% coverage. And we can see that both in the case of noise-free data and in the case of noisy data, the reduced coverage data set leads to a better estimate of global mean temperature because while we have fewer observations, they are more representative of the surface of the Earth as a whole because they are more evenly distributed over the surface. This highlights two issues. When we're using a naive average, adding more data can make things worse. And so throwing away data can make things better. Generalized least squares or optimal averaging guarantees that adding more data never makes things worse, as well as always being better than the naive average. Now, this isn't a new result. This is based on work that was originally done by Ruvim Kagan in Russia in the 1970s, and he developed a method called optimal averaging, which was used in a global temperature data set by Vinnikov, now discontinued. And the generalized least squares mean, which I've been talking about, is a simplification of that mean. However, covariance matrix methods are all, have also influenced the work at NOAA in their spectral methods. And they're also used in Krigging methods, for example, the Berkeley and New York reconstructions. Now, under certain simplifications, Krigging, GLS, and optimal averaging all give the same results. However, that involves assuming that the Earth has no geomorphology. In practice, it's better to use the more sophisticated methods which can take into account geomorphology. For example, the Berkeley and York reconstructions both allow different behavior of the land and oceans. Now, this highlights two points. Firstly, we are not advocating that everyone use GLS to average temperature fields. GLS is a teaching tool. Its purpose is to show why the simple average is wrong and give a good conceptual understanding of the underlying methods. Secondly, there's a perception that the aim of infilling methods is to invent observations where we have none. However, this is a misconception. Our primary aim in infilling is to correctly weight the information that we have in order to reduce the bias due to having an unrepresentative sample. I'll finish with some recommendations. Firstly, avoid comparing time series derived from data with different spatial coverage. Any differences may be due to different coverage rather than anything else. Given that the observational datasets all have different coverage, this means that serious comparisons should always be made using gridded data rather than time series. Secondly, if you need to estimate a global mean from spatially incomplete data, use an appropriate estimator. Ideally, this should take into account both covariance and geomorphology. Finally, when comparing observations to models, don't assume that using an infilled record resolves the coverage problem, especially for the early record. Covariance methods can help us make better use of the information we have, but cannot create information from nothing. Models should be compared to observations using the observational coverage. I hope that has been helpful, and thank you for listening.